Welcome everyone. My name is Allison Lacaccia and I'm the Marketing Manager at Teshcon USA. We're here today with Frank Romano for an intimate conversation regarding the future of print and Frank's thoughts on Google's Paperless in 2013 initiative. We'll start today with a short video clip of Frank's home library, then I'll be asking Frank some poignant questions and we'll wrap up by inviting participants to ask questions and get Frank's expert advice. Before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone to use the question feature in GoToWebinar and just type in any questions you may have at any point during the presentation. We'll try our best to answer all of them in the Q&A portion. And now we're going to see a short video clip of Frank's home library. Hi, I'm Frank Romano. Welcome to my new library. Well, it's not so little anymore, but for 53 years I've been collecting books and memorabilia about the printing industry. As you know, I work in the future of the industry, inkjet, digital technology, but I love to look back at how we used to do things. This is one of the rarest things I have. This is a leaf from the Nuremberg Chronicle, 1493. So I've been collecting this material for years, and it goes beyond uh, a print. I also have, uh, are you ready for this? This is a Newton. This was the uh, first personal digital assistant came out from Apple uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, by the way, it died in 2000. <laughs> it didn't have a program that would handle anything after that. Uh, the most interesting thing is the original artwork for Gaudi's last typeface. So again, there are probably 2,000 books here. There are another 2,000 in the warehouse. But almost anything you can imagine about the history of the printing industry, from the Penrose Annual to a complete set of the inline printers, the first magazine for printing that was ever published, started in 1883. I always thought there were others over in Germany that were earlier, but no. Inline printer was the first magazine that the printing industry ever saw. My first job in the industry was in 1959, right out of high school and I worked for the Mergenthal Linotype Company. It was the greatest experience you could have because the company was converting from hot metal to photographic typesetting. This is my little newspaper corner. The beginnings of newspapers were really these little flyers, if you will, and they talked mostly about shipments into a certain port. This is the London Gazette from 1682. It's one of the first newsletters which became later newspapers. And I've been trying to collect them over the years, so this is one of the first. Uh, why am I holding a doorknob? This is my collection of Penrose annuals. In 18, this is the Tribune book of open air sports. This was the first book ever typeset on a linotype machine. This again was 1886. The Tribune had a publishing operation, and that's why they produced this book. Now, the, the, the next one is kind of weird. The Wonderful World of Insects. Now, why would I have a book on insects? Well, I really don't want a book on insects. But this was the first book that was ever typeset on a photographic typesetting machine, 1949. And, and, and there's a whole page in the back that tells you about it. Uh, one of the first books that was never published on the history of printing was in 1701. And by the way, uh, this one happens to be in English. There's another version of it in, in French. Uh, but again, there weren't many histories of printing that were done until we enter the, the, the 1900s as such, when Divini published his first major history of printing. So that was the short video clip, and the full-length version of Frank's Home Library video will be on the Teshcon USA website under Webinar Archives. And now I'm going to turn it over to Frank. Frank is live here in our Danvers, Mass. office and I'm going to be asking him some questions that I have prepared. Frank, what should printers know about the future of the industry? First of all, they should know that there will be a future. Now, we have to understand what happened. That we, for the first time in the history of printing, we had a competitor. Movies were never a competitor. Radio was never a competitor. Television was never a competitor. There was this thing called the Internet that no one ever predicted. Go back and look at all the literature, look at all the science fiction writers, no one ever predicted the internet, and yet it became the competitor to print. And as a result, we lost half the printers in the United States from 1995 until today. 
1995 was the point when we had the largest number. So as a result of losing some volume of print, we lost the printers who produced that print. We also lost the companies that made the paper for that print, that made the equipment for that print. Oh my God, we even lost the consultants who consulted about that print. And so that's what happened. So we now have about half the number of printers we had in 1995, from 65,000 to about 31,000 or so. That will probably go down another 1,000 or two um, over the next uh, few years and level off, and that will be the size of the printing industry going forward. So it will be a smaller, more compact printing industry and probably composed of more automated and more technologically advanced firms. You will not have the small companies sort of on the, on the out, outer edges of the industry with old equipment competing on price because they just will not be able to compete in the new world of print that will exist. So there will be a future for printing. There will be printers. And all of you who get, it, get through the next few years are probably OK. Great. Frank, the next question I have is, what can printers do to stay competitive in the current conditions? Current conditions change. What you have to do is be very efficient. You can no longer have a lot of people wandering around who don't do a heck of a lot. You need everything automated to the highest possible degree. So jobs come in over the web. They are handled in some way automatically. They are processed automatically. They are proofed automatically. They go through the system for either digital printing or computer to plate automatically. And then to JDF, you tie it in with the finishing system and with the distribution system. You have to be very efficient, number one. Number two, you have to do things that are different. Just having a 40-inch full-color press is no longer the requirement for being a printer. You now have to have advanced finishing equipment, and you have to be in other areas. You have to have new services for new kinds of print that will get you into your customers um, base operation. You can no longer just walk up to the print buyer and say, do you need any printing today? It's now a case of offering a total program. I mean, the one technology I see now that printers have, have uh, adapted has been a wide format inkjet. Why? Not because they want to be in the sign business, but because many of their customers are saying, well, give me the brochure, give me the signage, give me all the pieces of it. Let me deal with one company to do all that, rather than dealing with multiple companies to do all that. So if you do those two things, look for new services that you can offer, and then become very automated and very efficient, I think you'll have a good chance of making it into the future. And Frank, where do you see the industry in 10 years from now? In Keokuk, Iowa. No, no, <laughs> only kidding. Um, first of all, let's understand that, again, we've lost all these printers that have been out there. You, and you, you know, every one of you knows someone who's been acquired, merged, uh, consolidated, et cetera. And that's going to continue. Um, so if we look at this decade as we go through it, a lot depends on what happens with the economy. And not only the U.S. economy, by the way, but the worldwide economy, because it's all interrelated to a large extent. Um, you know, prices get too high in the United States, some printing goes offshore. I, I was in China, and I saw the volume of printing coming from the U.S. It was just mind-boggling, the kind of stuff that I saw. Um, as well as what happens with manufacturing. If that moves overseas, then all the printing associated with that manufacturing in terms of packaging moves with it. So over the next 10 years, we have to watch the economy very carefully. And we have to be geared in order to handle all the changes in the economy, because there will be ups and there will be downs. I mean, when, when, when the big problem of 2008 hit, it really affected a lot of printers. It took them by surprise. If you had been prepared for that, make sure that you had enough cash on hand, Make sure that you had enough, your customers that you dealt with paid you on a regular basis. I got, if you find any of them, you know, put them in bronze. Uh, so this decade coming up is going to be a tough decade for a lot of us because there's a lot of marketing people out there who have no concept um, about print. They, they only understand email and Twitter and all this new stuff. They don't understand how print plays a role. And by the way, a lot of marketing schools, you go for an MBA today, they really are still teaching marketing the old way and, and not really bringing in all the new stuff that's involved. So we need to sort of bring them up to speed. So if that next, this next decade is going to be successful for printers, we've got to make sure we keep our financial house in order. We've got to make sure we have the right technology in place. 
and we have to understand this new breed of customer that's out there. Because the print buyer of today is not the print buyer of yesterday. Very few of them understand a heck of a lot about print anymore. Because in many companies, they've consolidated those operations. I mean, Margie Dana has just done a study um, of, of print buyers and, and shown that most print buyers no longer have that vast experience base uh, that we had in the past. Because they've been taken from the production department or some other department and said, oh, you're in charge of, a, of a print buying. Uh, those who are old timers who know print buying, well, they, you'd love to deal with them because they understand what they're doing. So it's going to be a tough decade no matter what we do, and there's no way I'm going to make it easier for you. Now, you've sort of alluded to this, but do you, do you think that we'll see further consolidation? Oh, yes, absolutely. As I said, we're, we're about 31,000 printers right now. That's all kinds of printers, by the way. Quick printers, commercial printers, whatever. Um, and we'll lose another 1,000 or two of them through consolidation. I don't know if they'll actually go out of business. Most printers don't really go out of business as such. As you all know, that printers wind up with two major assets at, at the end of their life, if you will. Um, one, the building they're in, and two, the equipment they have. And in the old days, they could resell uh, those uh, presses. Uh, I mean, offset presses were highly desirable for the generation of printers who were coming up. And so you could sell your used equipment for more money than you paid for it originally um, and make a profit on old machines. Well, that was because they were mostly mechanical. When they want electronic after 1995, the electronics, like any computer you buy, like if I buy a Macintosh today, when I get it home and open the box, there's a little paper and it says, this machine is now obsolete. That's how quickly it all changes. So you put all this computer stuff on a press, and the mechanical part goes on forever. The electronic part, you've got a problem with. And so as a result, sales of used equipment are declining. And selling that equipment, by the way, even on a worldwide basis, is not easy anymore. So really, at the end of a printer's life, there's not much left. So that's why you're seeing mergers and acquisitions and consolidation as a way for two companies to come together and share facilities, equipment, et cetera. Also being able to justify new equipment. I mean, a new offset press is highly automated, highly efficient, but it's, it's expensive. So you really justify it by replacing two or three older presses, manual in most cases, with a new automated press. Well, that becomes an issue because of the price and most banks aren't advancing a lot of money to print it at this stage of the game. So the manufacturers are now going to have to figure out a way to handle the financing uh, for the printing companies that want to get into major new uh, offset equipment or even digital equipment. So it's a very, very changing marketplace right now. And yes, there will be a further decline in the number of printers. But once we hit that number, probably 29,000, 29,500 printers, that will be the number going forward to the end of the century. And what do you think of the outlook when comparing offset to digital? Now, offset still has a life. You know, I get quoted that somehow I'm saying that, that, that offset's going to decline to a, a very low amount. That's not true. Remember now, letterpress was the dominant process for several hundred years. Um, and if you read articles from the 1950s, I have one, by the way, that's my classic. It says, uh, it's only good for quick and dirty printing. And it referred to offset lithography. Because letterpress was so dominant, as offset was coming in, it was sort of the, the interloper. Um, when digital came in, they said very similar things. It's only good for quick and dirty printing. Um, and, and of course, now digital has taken away a good percentage of offset volume. I believe offset volume, which was at almost 100%, will go down to about 40%. 40%. That will be the volume of offset printing um, in North America. Uh, digital printing will wind up probably at another 40 to 45% or so. It will be a little bit larger than offset printing. You will still have a piece that's flexo, and by golly, you're not going to kill gravure. It still figures out a way to hang in there. Um, and, and screen printing. You have to count screen printing to some extent, although a lot of screen printing is being replaced by inkjet at this stage. So you will have all these processes, and offset will still be a very strong part of it. But the biggest problem with offset is, is make ready. Now, on a modern press, it's very low. But that modern press is not one that most printers can afford. So they're still stuck with their, their legacy equipment that requires some number of minutes of, of, of make ready, uh, whereas digital equipment really has virtually zero make ready. So longer runs will go on offset. Shorter and medium-sized runs will go on digital. 
And again, for modern offset equipment, you can probably move some of those smaller runs onto the uh, offset equipment. But again, only if you have one of the truly modern offset presses. That's why most of the uh, offset companies are really offset press manufacturers are looking at moving into digital in some way. And that some of them have partnered with Lambda um, or have other development programs going on. So they're not writing off digital, but they've come into it late, and they're trying to come up with a way of integrating the mechanisms of their presses with new technologies in some way. But again, offset lithography will continue for a long period of time, but it will no longer be the dominant process. And the last question I have, we've all been hearing so much about the Google Paperless in 2013 debate, and just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Um, the, um, I bought the last printed issue of Newsweek uh, magazine in electronic form. All right, I know that's weird. Um, but I, a lot of, all right, I did buy the printed version as well. Okay. Um, but, you know, this is really not a debate because you're not going to stop the forces of, of electronic communication. Um, in the uh, 1970s, I was quoted in, in Wall Street Journal, and the quote was, there'll be a paperless office when there's a paperless bathroom. Now, by the way, I hear that quote nowadays a lot, even though I was first. Uh, the, the important thing is that back then, Wang said that our offices would be paperless, and today offices are Wangless. So we're not going to stop the, the inevitable forces that are taking information that is on paper and putting it into electronic form. That's going to happen. And there are people, by the way, there are kids growing up today that this is the world they understand. This is the world they don't understand. And so let's, let's face it. So spending a lot of time sort of tilting at windmills, trying to fight Google or Konica or whoever the company is that uses the word paperless, it's, it's foolhardy. You can't win. They're going to go in electronic form, and we're going to have to find a way to get paper into that mix in some way. So what the printing industry should be doing, instead of these little crusades to sort of fight this paperless trend, is really helping printers understand where new markets are. Where can you sell printing? There are certain markets that are going away. You know, certain kinds of print. I mean, Variety magazine uh, just announced today uh, that they're not going to have a printed edition anymore. <laughs> That's a major change. You know, there's a 100-year-old publication no longer on paper. Go. You're going to go argue with them and say, oh, you have to go back onto paper. Our biggest problem right now, and what the trade association should be doing, is fighting the Postal Service. Every time they raise rates, they make it harder to distribute this, and they make it easier to distribute this. And when they cut out Saturday delivery, it's going to be even worse. So we've got some very serious problems out there that are really engendered by the Postal Service. So you just had to get me started on paperless, didn't you? Uh, because it's really not a fight that the printing industry can win. We should be having other fights. The Postal Service is number one, and number two is helping printers find new markets, using new technology to find new areas where we can sell printing. And that printing may not be on paper. It may be on plastic or fabric or ceramic or metal or glass, but it'll be printing. And that's where the future is going to be. So forget about the word paperless. Forget about those foolish fights. Let's move into the future aggressively knowing what we want to do. And fighting these battles is not the way to do it. Well, thank you very much, Frank. We really appreciate those insightful answers. I'd like to open it up now to invite participants to ask questions. And as I mentioned earlier, if you could just use the question feature of GoToWebinar, and I will be reading the questions to Frank, and he'll be giving us his expert advice. I don't know if it's expert, but that's okay. okay. <coughs> the first question that came in is, and this is from Roger, will roll-to-roll -roll inkjet finally get to a price and speed point where they will replace traditional rotary offset in the business forms market, or is that market too mature for the investment? No, I think you're on the right track. Uh, if you look at what's happening with the uh, roll-fed inkjet, or in fact, all inkjet, 
it, every day it's getting cheaper and more effective. Um, and the roll widths, don't forget, we started out very narrow, 20 inches. Now we're up to 42 inches on one of the HP uh, inkjet presses. <laughs> some are roll-to-roll, -roll, some have uh, integrated finishing. But you're absolutely right. Right now on your existing equipment, it's really very inexpensive. And that's because you can deal with the make ready because you've got a longer run. And the cost of the make ready is distributed over the entire run. So we don't have that with inkjet. So you really have to look at the price of the ink and the heads more than anything else. And those two prices costs are coming down on a regular basis. Um, I, and I know that from experience in the book side of the industry, where a lot of the companies that ordered the first of those uh, roll-fed machines um, started to order a second one, and now some are ordering a third one. And you don't do that unless the cost is coming down. And uh, we can see that in almost every case. So you're on the right track. The forms industry is going to, what's left of the forms industry, let's be honest, um, is going to move to some form of inkjet. Great. The next question we have is from Artie, and Artie says that he very much respects your work and your knowledge, Frank, and asks, do you see inkjet printers and copiers taking market share from laser-based equipment in the near future? Not only in the near future, but it's already happened, Artie. That's why yesterday uh, Xerox announced that it's buying a company called Impica in France that makes uh, production inkjet equipment um, because they have lost some volume uh, of uh, laser or toner-based uh, printing equipment at Xerox, um, as well as other companies, uh, to uh, this inkjet uh, uh, movement. Um, inkjet has been moving very aggressively in the last few years. Now, by the way, it's not only inkjet. Be careful. This lambda process that's been announced is really, uh, <laughs> is, is really liquid toner, um, but it's delivered with inkjet heads. So you've got inkjet, which is, can be thermal, uh, which is water-based, or UV, um, or solvent-based, uh, then you've got liquid toner, which is delivered by inkjet heads. And then, of course, you've got toner-based. Uh, and uh, that gets you into traditional uh, powder toner or into liquid toner delivered by electrophotography. So the whole world of digital printing now is very, very expansive. And trying to get your arms around it gets harder and harder. But there's no doubt in my mind that we've, uh, the, the toner-based people have lost some volume to inkjet. And that will continue, which is why you're seeing such aggressive moves by many of these companies in the toner-based space to move into the uh, inkjet-based space. And Artie goes on to say, HP's edge line didn't work, but it seems like many OEMs want to move into this area. Is it because they make so much money on the ink and maintenance is lower? OK, several questions there. First of all, edge line was a bomb. There's no doubt about it. But it wasn't a bomb because of the printing technology. It was a bomb because of the mechanism. It, when it, did, it was an 8.5 by 11 inch printer, but when it did an 1117 sheet, it had to mount it on a drum, do part of it, print part of it, and then move the drum or the heads, and then print the other part and stitch the two areas together. The dumbest idea ever for an office-based machine that you know, would get, get a lot of volume. However, the heads from Edgeline became the heads in the HP um, roll-fed inkjet presses, which, by the way, are doing phenomenally well. People in the book industry, transaction industry, um, and, and direct mail industry love them. And, uh, and, and I've been in several of their operations, uh, especially uh, the, the O'Neill Data Systems in California, which had the first one. And they're up to three or four machines right now because they, they've seen the cost factors. Originally, those heads were disposable for each shift. Some of those heads now are going on for months or even longer. So right off the bat, we're seeing a, a shift in the reliability and cost factors of inkjet as more and more technology gets into the field. OK, and the second part of his question was? Um, is it because they make so much money on the ink and maintenance is lower? Yes. You see, this is what scares all of us, that you're buying this equipment from the same company that makes the ink, and you can only buy the ink from them. And in some cases, you might have to buy the paper from them, uh, which is scary, too. So th this is part of the problem. We're all worried that once we're locked in with that manufacturer, if they raise prices, there's nowhere else to go. There's no competition. Today, you can compete with people who make plates. You can compete with people who make ink. You can compete with almost all the companies that make consumables for your device. But on the inkjet field, you don't have that kind of flexibility. So right now, it looks like they all, under or the manufacturers, understand the situation. And they're not, they're not doing anything because they realize that once they did something adverse, the publicity would be so overwhelmingly bad that they would have to stop immediately. 
So right now, we're seeing them operate on a pretty ethical basis. And the last part of that is... Hey, Artie, how many parts do you get? <laughs> He says, as an all-digital shop, should I be watching any particular inkjet manufacturer for new equipment? Well, I guess you have to watch Landis. There's absolutely no doubt that Landis is going to have something. I mean, you, you don't get 400 companies signing a letter of intent and many of them putting money down on a machine that's a year or two away. I mean, this is amazing. Uh, but Landa has a lot going for it. Uh, one, the way they ship the ink without water and then you mix it with water. Uh, the, the fact that uh, when, when they put the ink on the paper, all the water goes away, um, that it's almost an offset process using a blanket, um, uses less ink, so it brings down the cost of printing. Uh, I don't mean to be a, a promoting Lander, but certainly there's something there. You don't spend hundreds of millions of your own money, as Lander has done, uh, to get to this point and not have something that's going to succeed. So I believe you really have to watch what they're doing. But there are also interesting things happening at Zycon, which is moving into liquid toner. They bought the rights to all the Australian uh, Research Association patents on liquid toner. There's some interesting stuff happening at OSE, um, especially in the packaging marketplace. Um, RICO has done a very good job with the screen uh, true press jet, in fact, the largest population of roll-fed inkjet machines out there right now. So lots going on with many companies. And of course, now what's happening at the Xerox with Impica, that's going to, I think they'll move very quickly, and you'll start to see uh, some really interesting products momentarily. The next question we have is... No more from Artie? <laughs> no more from Artie. Uh, another one from Roger who asks, should the Postal Service cut out Monday instead of Saturday? I think they should cut out Sunday. Uh, they shouldn't cut out, a, there's no reason to cut out a day. They've got the infrastructure to handle it. And by the way, the savings from saving one day is peanuts, peanuts. And by the way, they're still going to deliver packages on that day. Um, so it makes no sense at all to me. And if you take one day out of the cycle for when bills are delivered, uh, when publications are delivered, I mean, you really affect the entire infrastructure of the way we communicate. Uh, by the way, mail is going to be there, print is going to be there, just less. What happened was the Postal Service didn't see that your first class mail was going to shift. A lot of it shifted over to electronic bill presentment and payment. So we pay our bills electronically. Many of you do. I do. Um, I, I, I think the only bill I get on paper is the Boston water bill. For some reason, they don't have an efficient system for handling that. Um, so many of us have gotten away from getting a printed bill or statement. All right. Um, and then the biggest shift was, Remember when you got a ton of, of credit card solicitation? That was all first class mail, and that went away. So, as, so you have these two problems. So what do you do? Well, you raise rates for everybody, not only first class, but magazines and books and everything. So now you start to affect all versions of print, all forms of print. Um, that's not the answer. What we need is to make the, the Postal Service more efficient. Now, they've tried that through several levels of automation but you still have two major costs that you really can't handle efficiently. One is fuel, because of all the vehicles they have, and the second is labor, because people move a lot of that stuff around manually. So there aren't any easy answers, but I'm sure there are answers out there. Our problem is they made the Postal Service an independent agency, but Congress still has a lot to say about what they do, and we know that Congress is inept. So we've got a real problem there. You had to get me started on the Postal Service. <laughs> The next question comes from Scott, and he asks, at what point do you see printing plates being eliminated? Oh, gosh. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble over this one. Uh, if you look into the future, how can you take an offset press and automate it to the highest degree? Eliminate the plates. Now, Van Roland had a machine called the Dyka Web, which was, well, to say it was a dog would be an understatement. It had a lot of problems associated with it. But it was on the right track. It imaged the cylinder, and then you could print some quantity. And then you could erase it and, and re-image the cylinder. Re-imaging the cylinder makes some sense if you get the speed up. In other words, if it takes half an hour to image the cylinder, forget about it. So you have to do it perhaps under two minutes or something like that. And there are a number of development efforts going on around the world right now, especially in some of the press manufacturers. Now, they all have the same statement. Plates are very inexpensive. This is true. 
But the problem is you've got to get the plate to the press, on the press, register the plate, and then get the color up and then print. So you still have a form of make ready. And as long as you have make ready, offset will not be able to really grow. It's going to continue to lose volume to digital where you don't have make ready. So I think that's the future. We've got to figure out a way to get rid of the major consumable involved in printing. Now, I'm sorry all you guys who make plates. You do a great job. The plate business, by the way, is doing phenomenally well. Plate volume is up. Wait a minute, you say, Romano, how can plate volume be up if the volume of printing is down? Well, because there are more short runs. More short run, more plates. And so plate business is doing relatively well. And I think it will stay that way for a long time. But at some point, someone's going to figure out how to image those cylinders for, for medium and long runs. And that's going to change the printing business. We have another question coming in from Dan. And Dan asks, where would you look to find the new market? Ah, if I were a printing company and I had money, the first thing I would buy would be a wide format flatbed inkjet printer, UV. Now, why? Because printing on paper has become a commodity. And you all understand those markets. You know brochures and flyers and mailers and all the things that we print on paper. But there's another whole market that's evolving, printing on fabric. Printing on fabric gets you into the home decor market, where the drapes match the covering on the chairs, or even the carpeting. Or you print on glass to give you a Tiffany look. Um, or you print on plastic. Or you print on ceramics. Now you say, oh, wait, I'm a printer. I, I sh this is not my market. Yes, it is your market. It is printing. And by the way, if you can print on all those things, you will also get the paper-based communication that goes with it, the promotion piece, the, the, the brochure, or whatever. So the, the markets in the future, some people call it industrial printing. Some call it functional printing. But it's printing in color on esoteric materials. And that's where the money's going to be. Because it's not a competitive market at this stage. It's a growth market. And I'm not talking about printing on metal labels that go in cars. That, that's purely an industrial market. I'm talking about all these esoteric things that most people aren't thinking about today. But the home decoration market is changing. The fabric marketplace is changing. Um, the Let's call it the tchotchke market. You know, the little things you pick up uh, at trade shows. Um, th that whole world is changing right now to inkjet printing. And those who master inkjet printing with thick materials is really going to be building a really great marketplace into the future. And we have another question here from George. And George asks, do you think that the print color quality of inkjet will be as good as offset quality? The print color quality of inkjet has already exceeded offset. Remember, in offset, to print pictures, you have to make dots. In inkjet, your continuous tone. Ask anybody, what's higher quality, photographs or printing? I mean, the way we tried it in the, in the past was to take a photograph and try to reproduce that with dots. You had all kinds of gamut suppression because you couldn't get the same gamut. Uh, inkjet, by the way, not only can go CMYK, but they've already added in most inkjet printers lighter cyan, lighter magenta, and other colors that increases the gamut substantially. So I've, I've interviewed a number of people about this. And those who are really measuring this stuff are discovering that some of the inkjet systems actually exceed the quality of off offset lithography. And the next question comes to us from John. And John asks, from a family-owned printing company that can barely afford offset digital and large format equipment, what can we do to affordably offer more services? OK. The way to offer more services without having to buy more equipment is to start to get into the electronic side of things. You have customers for whom you print a brochure. Help them do the email blast. There's very inexpensive software you can buy from a number of companies that provide social media software. So you can create messaging that gets released through Facebook, or ties in with LinkedIn, or tweets messages to some audience. Um, this will allow you then to expand your base without buying a lot of expensive equipment. And and again, it's a sell that's related to what you're already selling. So when you go into a company and you're selling them a promotion piece that you're printing, 
find out how they're handling the other communication because they're all using social media in some way. They're all using electronic communication in some way. Figure out where that's being done. It's probably not being handled through the print buyer. Oh, why not? Why can't? Because you already have the images. You already have the material. Why not figure out a way to repurpose that into electronic communication? So it's a very easy way for a small shop. And by the way, you don't need an expensive person. Hire a high school kid, you know, junior or senior. These kids are so advanced. I mean, I see the freshmen coming into RIT. These kids are so advanced in computers, it's mind-boggling to me. I mean, I see my little granddaughters, you know, with the iPad mini, and I said, where will these kids be when they get into high school? So you can actually start down the road uh, to, uh, to offering these new services uh, without a lot of expense. The next participant says, hello, my name is David, and I work at Sony, and we print on CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray disc and PlayStation games. And we do offset print and screen print of printing discs, and we still do a lot of lino printing film. How much longer is film going to stay around because a lot of customers are still wanting screen printing? Okay, great questions there. First of all, I cannot imagine you into the future printing on CDs and DVDs. I mean, we, we download movies now routinely. And yes, there'll probably be a market out there. I think it's going to be a, an on-demand marketplace. If you want to have that DVD, that's going to be an on-demand market and you're going to print that with a little inkjet printer that prints the DVD for you. You're not going to mass produce DVDs. Uh, for your PlayStation, you're still going to print on some of the plastic material using screen printing. By the way, that's where screen printing really built its base. T-shirts and then industrial printing. They could print on plastic and glass and ceramics and all that kind of stuff. So what's going to happen is a lot of that, those components to your system are probably going to be printed with inkjet, with UV inkjet as, as we move forward into the future. And you're absolutely right about film. I cannot imagine analog technology as we move into the future. It's a digital world, and we're going to go digital. I mean, just like, was it last year or so, when they used up the last box of Kodachrome film? It was in a refrigerator in Kansas somewhere. And a, a photographer for a National Geographic got the right to go around the world and take the 20 or 30 photos that could be taken on that roll. And that was a big thing, because it was the end of that world of color on film. And I cannot imagine into the future we're going to do a lot of that at all. And another question from Roger. <clears throat> hey, Roger, you're getting like Artie. <laughs> Roger says, given the boom in wide and grand format printing, do you see this segment of the digital market becoming a disposable product, driving a shorter usage time, generating frequent replacement orders? Yes. It's a signage marketplace, signage of all kinds in all places, outdoor, indoor, uh, backdrops, sets, things for plays and movies and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it changes constantly. Um, the best business you can have is, is to have someone at the uh, exhibition center in your city or town recommending you to all the exhibitors because the exhibitors come in and then realize at the last minute that they forgot to make up a sign somewhere along the line. And of course, with Inkjet, you can do it almost immediately. Uh, and you're absolutely right, by the way. You want to be able to handle every size format, from small up to grand, because signage is all over the place. Go to any trade show. Uh, just walk around any city and look at the signs in windows uh, that you see. It's unbelievable how much signage is out there. Now, they say that the competitor to these analog signs, these inkjet printed signs, will be digital signage. Yes, but not everywhere. You're not going to be able to afford that kind of stuff everywhere. And you may have a difficulty putting it out, outdoors um, in, in rain and snow. So my feeling is that it will become a disposable market. It will become an on-demand market. Um, and it will be a growth market for a long period of time. And here's a question from Jenko. He says, Mr. Romano, what do you think about Impica inkjet system for labels roll to roll regarding other vendors or, let's say, technology? Two, which technology can support pharmaceutical labels more than others? Okay. That's a very good question. By the way, Impica makes a great system. I've seen it now in a number of places, different trade shows, different events, different places. And uh, it, it's a very reliable system. It's UV inkjet. They do a great job. And yes, any roll-fed system could handle labels. But your CMYK with Impica 
And the problem with labels is many of the labels require brand colors. 80% of your brand colors or more can be handled with CMYK. But it's that 20% that you can handle that will kill you, which is why Indigo from HP has done such a great job in the label market. It's liquid toner, by the way. But they've done that because they can be roll-fed, and they can also handle up to three brand colors. This, this gives them a major advantage. So Impeka probably will have the ability, if they haven't already, to have more inks in the machine at one time. And that will help them then move into the brand color uh, area. Uh, and again, remember now, many companies on their labels want that special Pantone color, that special brand color, and that's part of the label marketplace. You can't write it off. And you can't say, well, if they handle 80% through CMYK, that's OK. Well, again, that 20% is the part of it that will kill you. And so watch that very carefully if you move into that marketplace. I should mention, by the way, that at, at Drupa, there were 20, 20 or more systems that only handle labels. And again, if you only want CMYK, you can get them at every level from small to gigantic. And if Pika can just as easily do that CMYK. But if you want to do the brand color stuff, then you're limited to a small number of companies. And the next question comes to us from Ron. And Ron asks, where do you see the packaging market going? Will it continue to grow, or will it slow down? The packaging market is only, can only be a growth market. There's no way to deliver a package over the internet. You can't send a box of Wheaties electronically. Uh, so packaging will always be an analog market. Now you go into the supermarket, half is on paper, cardboard, boxes, cartons. Um, the other half is on film. And so you're going to have that balance between those two worlds. Uh, and packaging, by the way, the run rates are getting shorter because you go into Wegmans, there are a whole bunch of Wegmans brands. And Ron knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, so you're going to find more localized brands. You're going to find more, more specialized brands. That means that the packaging changes. They also change the look of packaging now on a regular basis. Um, and by the way, in Rochester, they put kids on the packages who've done something heroic in, in Rochester. Um, again, specialty marketplace to a large extent. So packaging can only be a growth market. Packaging um, will engender all kinds of opportunities for digital and for offset and for flexo and for reviewer, depending on the quantity uh, printed. Um, and there's no electronic competitor, so it, it, it has free reign. So that's why every manufacturer is saying that they're entering the packaging marketplace. They have to, because that's where the growth is. We have another question from Roger, who promises this will be his last one. He says, I've heard some discussion on adding inkjet color to the frame of a traditional flexo press to utilize the press transport system and just replace flexo plate process. Is this really cost effective, and what print quality is lost or gained? OK, now that's a great question. Um, if you go back <coughs> only a few years, um, Dotrix, which was a company that was acquired by AGFA, um, that had a mechanism, an inkjet system that went on your flexo press. So you could print your six, eight colors by flexo. And then you could do your photographs or images with, with inkjet um, if you wanted a certain level of quality on color. Um, and then you could also integrate into that flexo line um, rotary screen, um, gravure coating, all kinds of things. So the great thing about flexo is that you can integrate all these different printing processes, finishing processes, coating processes all in line. And that's its great advantage. Now, Dotrix doesn't exist anymore. Agfa discontinued it. However, uh, EFI has a system that will then do the same thing. You put the, all the heads in line and do it that way. There are a few installations out there where people want to do special graphics. As you know, doing photographs, imagery, with, with Flexo is not easy. You have to break everything up into spot colors. So if you want something like a halftone, you really need a, a different way of doing it. And that's what some companies are doing it. And the speeds are such that they can do it all in line. Um, and, and that's how I envision what, what, what will happen with Flexo. It will upgrade different heads for doing different kinds of things. And ultimately, you ready for this? We're going to get rid of the Flexo. It'll all be inkjet. As soon as we figure out how to print on film, 
with, with inks that are not a problem for food, and that's happening very quickly, then you're going to start to see a lot of that flexo printing move over to the inkjet area. And that's, the pieces are all there. Within the next few years, it's going to become a major market. The next question is from Ariana, and she asks, how do you think foreign digital textile printers will affect printers looking to enter digital textile markets domestically? Now, that's good. Uh, because the reason you go overseas for textile printing is because you want gigantic quantities. You don't go overseas because you want short runs. It just doesn't make any sense. So I believe, as, as our world moves to more short runs and more on demand, a lot of that printing that went overseas will start to move back to the United States. I mean, there's no reason to go to China to print 50 of something and then put it on a plane or a ship to come back to the United States. So on demand um, and short runs really engender local production. Um, so when they have a, a show, a fashion show in New York, you know, they have to plan for that months in advance because they have to design something. Then they have to go to China to get the first versions and get a proof. Then they have to review the proof and make the changes, and then have them do another short run in China to get it back in time for the show. And in some cases, they're sewing the dress just before the model is walking down the runway. So you're going to see this marketplace, I think, move back. So fabric printing in short runs will move back to the United States. Fabric printing in long runs, they stay overseas. We have a couple more questions. The next one is from Robert, and he asks, how long before large format digital flatbed printers throughput will match that of large format silkscreen printers? Yes, yes, good point. Um, actually, you're already seeing it. The, the uh, Inca onset uh, from Fujifilm is one of the fastest uh, flatbed inkjet printers on Earth. In fact, the, I was at an operation in Toronto that ran them, and they put these speed cones around the machine because they didn't want people to get too close because it went so fast. Uh, so, and, and by the way, the, the Empress from uh, Agfa is a very high-speed machine as well. And that's a, that's a sheet that's 81 inches, by the way, thin or thick material. So we're already starting to see the flatbed machines uh, move up in speed. And what they're doing is, is the thing that helped it more than anything else is single-pass inkjet, where instead of having the head move back and forth on a shuttle, now you have one array of heads. And that's increasing. And by the way, it's only a matter of time they just add more heads and they get to speed up even more. So there's no reason why flatbed inkjet uh, will not be faster than a rotary screen or any form of screen printing. And here's a question from Frank, a different Frank. What do you believe will be Kodak's future? I think Kodak will succeed. Kodak, by the way, is a major supplier to the printing industry. There's not a package or a piece of printing you pick up that's not touched by some kind of Kodak technology. And not only are they strong in the printing industry, both in analog with plates and with digital, of course, in many ways, but also they've got a lot of development going on in functional or industrial printing. Um, again, there are a lot of areas of, of your electronic devices that are touched by Kodak technology. So yes, they've had their problems in recent years, as a lot of companies have had, and the press just loves to make all kinds of puns and jokes about Kodak, you know, about dark rooms and all that kind of stuff. But the fact is they're an iconic American company. And uh, I think they're working very hard and doing a very good job to move into the future. And I have no, no doubts that they will still be there and they will be a force in the printing industry and other industries that involve electronic printing. And here's a question from Josh. And he asks, there was a question earlier about not being able to afford offset digital and large format. So how do they grow and expand? There was no mention about outsourcing to companies that specialize in being behind the scenes, offer web-to-print solutions, and the like to support these clients. What do you think of this model? That's a very good point, by the way. I should have mentioned it, so you should be here next time. Uh, <clears throat> and that is that a small company doesn't have to do everything. Remember when quick printers, you walked into a quick printer as a counter? And if you wanted to do uh, invitations, there was a book of invitations. If you wanted to do greeting cards, there was a book of invitations. If you wanted rubber stamps, there was a book that told you how to order rubber stamps. And they, they, they would then send it to a company that specialized in that area, um, and then you'd pick it up at the quick printer. Well, there's no reason. There are a lot of companies out there um, that will do printing for commercial printers um, as a service. Remember, we used to call them trade printers or gang printers. 
and they would have multicolor equipment. They would gang up jobs in order to get the cost down, and then they would do the printing for you and then supply it to you, and you would supply it to the customer. So yes, there are. I, I don't want to mention one company or two companies because then I'm only missing somebody. But you've seen some of them promoting all the time, uh, and they do a great job. And it's not only uh, business cards and invitations and greeting cards, uh, but it's all manner of, of flyers, brochures, and things like that. You could even partner with some of the online printing companies and create a branded website where people can order small jobs like business cards or invitations, and then you get a percentage of that money. So there are many ways to grow a business without actually doing the printing. Remember, printers have always had this feeling that they had to own the equipment. They had to have all the machinery right there. I don't think that's necessary anymore. I have another question here that's actually from Roger that I just don't want to forget. I caught you, Roger. You said no more. This is from earlier, but I, I passed by it. So here it is. Even after years of having the capability to generate BBP mailings, this market seems slow to grow. With the current strong focus in the news on big data, do you see VDP printers moving to a middle small data thinking to drive value from their existing capability? Yeah, see, variable data printing is one of those markets. By the way, digital printing right now, today, is about 15% of all printing. And variable data printing is about 1% of that. I mean, that's how small it is. Now, why hasn't, it, why hasn't this wonderful functionality grown? I blame the manufacturers. They wasted years on something called PPML that doesn't work. They didn't understand that today I can create a job, make a PDF, and send it to any printer on earth and they could handle it. No one, no one except Adobe, has created a, a product that can do the same thing for variable data. You've now got PDF v, VT. VT or VP, I forget. But it's with a slash and a V something. And it takes your data, your list, it takes your, your design, and puts everything in the PDF file, which theoretically could be accepted by any RIP that runs the PDF engine. That's the PDF RIP that only accepts PDF files, doesn't accept PostScript files. Now, many manufacturers have given lip service that they're going to adapt this, but very few of them actually have. So the problem is the manufacturers all supported a method that didn't work because they wanted to be able to say, oh, you can do this, or you can take our proprietary approach. And as a result, if you went with the proprietary approach, there was no way a designer could design something specifically for you. They would design, they would design something and then make a file to send to anybody. Now they had to design a file just for you. Now that might have been great to lock that customer up, but the customers aren't stupid. They don't want to do that. So we needed a more open way of doing it. And the manufacturers closed those doors. And they made it hard. If you make something hard, no one is going to do it. So you're absolutely right. In the age of big data, as we're discovering how to do this and how it delivers, I mean, there's no doubt that variable data delivers. The response rates are gigantic. Now, I have to admit, many companies don't know how to get the data, don't have the lists. But there are ways around that. There are list brokers. There are organizations that sell lists. Um, so, and there's some really creative stuff that can be done when you integrate the variable part in with the, the list. And I can get a mailing now that somehow we, I can react to because there's something about it that resonates with me. So you're absolutely right. We, we, we really screwed it up as an industry. Hopefully the manufacturers will get religion, but I'm sorry. Well, some of our manufacturers are like Congress. They're inept. Okay, we have another question here from a different Frank, who asks, how do you see the book printing industry now that e-books start to play a significant impact? Even though we have e-books and the volume of e-books is growing, nothing wrong with that, by the way. I was on a ship last year uh, with 4,000 old people, most of the people on ships, and I, I, there were never so many Nooks or Kindles and iPads in my life. Um, and because I wore my RIT shirt many times and had my computer, they thought I was tech support. So these little old ladies would come up and ask me to help them get their Nook set up or whatever. But I was impressed that many people are, are adapting to e-books. At the same time, the on-demand book industry is growing phenomenally. And it's not only the one-off book. It's what I now call longer short runs. 
it used to be that you printed a book one at a time. If you go to Amazon, it says it's going to take four days to get you a book. In most cases, that book is being printed on demand for you. Um, and it's one at a time. But now we're starting to see that publishers have finally gotten on-demand religion. And instead of printing one at a time, they're printing 50 or 100 or 200 and, and distributing them to bookstores. And then if they sell, because they're getting really instantaneous feedback from the few bookstores that are left, uh, they can then get the run to another 200 or 300. So they don't have to print thousands at a time or have giant inventories. They finally discovered that on-demand printing works one at a time, 10 at a time, 100 at a time, 500 at a time. And new roll-fed inkjet systems are allowing them to do that at this stage. So we're seeing toner-based digital printers for this very short run. We're seeing the roll-fed inkjet for the medium and, and what I'm going to call longer short runs. And that's what's really increasing the number of books. Now let's be careful. You've also got photo books in there, uh, specialty books, recipe books. I went to my 50th high school reunion. They gave us a book of all of us. By the way, I never saw so many old people in my entire life. Uh, so the book industry is growing both on the electronic side, and believe it or not, it's growing on the print side, but one at a time. So we have a few more questions here, and then we're going to be wrapping up. The next question is from Don, and Don asks, does this PDF for VDP cache images? Yes. It only puts it in once, and then it uses it as many times as, as it's needed. Um, and that's one of the advantages. It makes the file something uh, smaller and easier to deal with. I'm sure if you go to the Adobe website, you can get all the information you need. Another question from Janko. Where do you see developing spots within workflows? Or differently, where should we put extra gain in building workflows where there is still space to improve? We've done a phenomenal job with, with workflow. I mean, you, you look at now, you know, you go to a website, you set the file in, you get a PDF proof back almost immediately. It goes through automatic pre-flighting. I mean, God bless Pit Stop and all the things that and Focus has done to really analyze files and discover problems and help us fix those problems. Um, so, and, and, and then JDF has done a great job, of course, carrying all the data around about the job. I think if there's an area that we really have to move into, it's going to be work in the uh, finishing area. Because really, more and more digital systems have integrated uh, finishing. And that's one of the reasons that digital can be so efficient. I can send it the file, and out the other end comes finished brochures, flyers, books, catalogs, whatever it may be. Um, and as the cost become, becomes more effective, comes down, then you're going to see more and more of that happen. And we then have to tie in the, the, the workflow in a more, I don't want to say integrated because it already is, but more efficient way. Because in some cases, the workflows are a little weird because the finishing systems don't have all of the connections. Well, I think we have time just for this one last question. That's also from Don. And Don asks, is the rumor about Konica Minolta partnering with Komori for a large format inkjet? It's not a rumor. They had a machine, a trooper, called the KM-1. I love it, KM-1. Sounds like a military vehicle. Um, yes, and you, by the way, you see a lot of those relationships between digital companies and press companies. Um, by the way, Komori has already partnered with other companies as well, as well as being a company that has partnered with Lambda. And in fact, the Lambda sheet fed machines at Drupal were actually built by uh, Komori. So Komori, I think, has a, a head start in integrating digital technology into their existing mechanisms of various kinds. And of course, you've got Heidelberg working with Lambda. You've got Nan Roland working with Lambda. I mean, almost every offset press manufacturer is working with somebody, either known or unknown, in order to integrate their high-speed, efficient mechanical devices with some kind of digital imaging technology and putting that all together. Well, that's great. We're, we're just about out of time here, but I want to thank everyone for attending and participating and asking all these great questions. And I want to thank Frank for being here. This has really been a pleasure. I want to let everyone know that a recording of the webinar will be on the TeshCon USA website under Webinar Archive. And if you have any questions at all or for some reason can't find the recording, please call us at 978-777-1854. Take care, everybody.